Hey everyone, Tom Salemi here. Welcome back to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. So we've got a great episode for you today. Uh, we'll be talking with Nick Damiano. He is the uh, CEO of Andromeda Surgical. And uh, I'm, I've been meeting so many new and fascinating surgical robotics companies over this past year between uh, our Device Talks meetings and SRS. And uh, it's just been uh, really, really educational. And uh, Andromeda Surgical is one of those for sure. I wasn't quite sure what the approach was, and uh, Nick uh, tells a good story. And uh, Andromeda is really exploring an interesting model, including one where uh, it's building a system that would be agnostic for the uh, for the type of uh, um, uh, end user devices that would be used, kind of like Rob Surgical, which I saw in uh, at SRS. So uh, enjoyed talking with Nick. Nick's been on the podcast before, uh, but was uh, happy to bring him back and retell his story. Uh, before my conversation with Nick, uh, I spoke with Brody Galloway, who is a young man I met up when he was in Boston. Uh, he was here for uh, the Moonshot program uh, that was put together by Santos Shire. And um, he's uh, an impressive young, young, young person, young man. And uh, we'll talk about uh, Envision MedTech. It's uh, an effort that he uh, spearheaded after his own uh, very... Um, ongoing uh, experience with healthcare and with med tech. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, but he's really turned that experience into, uh, into an incredible positive. And I think you should listen to the interview. And if you can help uh, in what he's trying to do, please uh, reach out to him. He's on LinkedIn. So uh, connect with Brody Galloway, even if you can't help connect with Brody Galloway on LinkedIn. He puts up some, some really thoughtful stuff. And uh, he's got a uh, an eye for medtech in the future, and that makes me happy. So uh, listen to that interview. And then, of course, before that, Chris Newmarker is back with the Newmarker's Newsmakers. Uh, in what has uh, kind of a, uh, a Life Imitates podcast sort of, uh, <laughs> sort of uh, happenstance. So Chris and I recorded the Newsmakers uh, at 10 o'clock Eastern this morning. Uh, I'll, I'll spoil it for you a little bit. One of the newsmakers centered around, uh, Baxter's, uh, really unfortunate, uh, troubles it's having with its facility in North Carolina due to Hurricane Helene. Obviously it's having a great impact on the healthcare industry, feared shortages of IV bags and other supplies. So, uh, really underlined, uh, the supply chain sort of vulnerability that we felt during COVID. It feels like it's, it's coming back during COVID and during some other hurricanes as well. So, Baxter is doing everything he can, of course, to accommodate uh, his customers and to ensure that the supply of medical uh, medical supplies continues. As a result, and I found this out probably about two hours after Chris and I recorded this uh, this New Markers Newsmakers, uh, unfortunately, Baxter's uh, won't be able to send, understandably won't be able to send its speakers to Device Talks West. Uh, that includes Heather Knight, who's Executive Vice President and Group President of medical products and therapies uh, includes a, a very interesting supply chain conversation that we're, we're going to have. Chris Newmark was going to lead, and it includes uh, Cecilia Soriano, who's the president of Infusion Therapies and Technologies at Baxter International. Uh, so as you can uh, imagine, uh, the folks at Baxter are super busy, uh, too busy to speak at a, a dopey conference that I put together. So completely understand their point and uh, really wish them the best. And they'll be a big part of Device Talks in 2025. Uh, they're great friends of ours now, great partners of ours now, I should say. And uh, they participated in, in some of our uh, Connected Health uh, conversations. They were a big part of Device Talks Boston, and that will continue. So uh, we at Device Talks wish the folks at Baxter all the best and look forward to having you at our future events. Uh, we've already made adjustments to the Device Talks West Agenda. Uh, we, for the first time, had a lunch or afternoon keynote at Device Talks West, uh, but we're going to move that afternoon keynote to the traditional opening day one slot that Heather Knight was going to occupy. So uh, attendees will be able to hear from Mustafa Tului, who is the MedTech Product Management Lead for NVIDIA. Perhaps you've heard of NVIDIA. Uh, it's a, obviously a company that's making a huge impact on the globe and in MedTech. And you're going to get a uh, an early glimpse or a sneak glimpse into the future of medical devices, uh, software-defined, AI-enabled, and robotic. So that's the title of Mustafa Tului, Dr. Mustafa Tului's uh, presentation. 
and that will be at 9.30 on October 16th. So uh, this is, uh, we were, we we're fortunate to have such a deep bench, and uh, this is why. This is why you have a deep bench. So it's going to be a great couple of days. Make sure you join us at Device Talks West, happening on October 16th and 17th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. I realize I've been looking at my microphone the whole time and not at the camera. So, hey, everybody. Um, it's a pretty big microphone, though. It's kind of distracting. Anyway, uh, that was for those folks who are watching this on video. If you're listening to a podcast, you have no idea what I'm looking at. So I'll, I'll just continue. So anyway, join us at Device Talks West. Use the code DTPOD25 to save 25%. Go to west.devicetalks.com to register. Uh, we don't have a Device Talks Tuesdays coming up this Tuesday. Uh, that'll be, we put that off until after Device Talks West because we just have so much going on. Uh, but that'll be brought to you by T Connectivity. Actually, it'll come in. Uh, it'll be part of our November programming. So, no device talks Tuesdays coming up. And uh, that's it, folks. Uh, lots of news here, obviously. And uh, enjoy this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. Let's hit it. All right, you ready for this? Ready. Fall, at least in Minneapolis, like nice, nice little chilly morning. So yeah, no, it's it's fall everywhere, Chris. We all use the same calendars for the most yeah, part. We're, and, uh, we're yeah. kind of in the same latitude, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I had a brisk fall walk with uh, Daisy Dog this morning in the oh, woods. Nice. It was lovely. So. Oh, that's wonderful. No bugs, cool temps. I'll take fall any day, all day long. Have you got? Uh, you haven't gotten a frost yet, though, right? We have not gotten a frost. Yet. Okay. I always, I always love the first frost because all the mosquitoes are dead. It's just fantastic. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden, it's yeah. like you know what? I can walk in the woods without, you know, put like having to worry about putting on DEET or whatever. You know, I can just, you know, it's fantastic. So I, I, I had uh, a friend uh, over this weekend, and he talked about mosquitoes. He said that he's reading a book, and where he learned that mosquitoes were responsible for like half the deaths ever. Yeah. They're out to get us. <laughs> like, they're, ever. I like, mean. Half the people who died in history of man died because of mosquitoes. I could see that. I mean, malaria. We're going to take care of this threat. Malaria, dang fever. Yeah. I, I, I saw <laughs> I saw we had some dang fever spreading in the U.S. this year. Like, somebody said, like, I had one of the neighbors, like, yeah, there's some dang fever, like, uh, making its way into the upper Midwest. I'm like, that's what that's what killed Panama Canal workers a hundred years ago. <laughs> I don't we want just to... have good old West Nile and, and Eastern yeah. equine encephalitis. So. I don't want to get sick old school. I mean, come on. Like, I, mean, I know, right? Like, like you know, your great grandpa had that. Did he survive? I don't know. <laughs> like, like, he didn't. He, he was gone. Yeah, that's how your great great grandpa, you know, the, the good old days when, you know, you could just count on cholera or malaria or, you know, that all, all that good stuff. So. This conversation has taken a dark, <laughs> dark turn. Yeah. Well, we do have Halloween coming up, you know. Like, we so do have yeah. Halloween coming up. We also have Device Talks West coming up. Yes. Let's brighten Much our better, moves. yes. Much better. Much not, better. Not a lot of mosquitoes in Santa Clara. No, you. no. Yeah, I haven't no. never swatted a mosquito away out, out, outside <laughs> of the convention center in Santa Clara, so. Yeah, if you're, October 16th and 17th at the Santa Clara. The autumn Center. weather is chilling you, like come to sunny Santa Clara and like uh, and look at the palm trees and then come in and, you know, learn about some great med tech. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're looking forward to that. We'll be there. Chris will be there. Yeah. I'll be there. We'll be leading discussions along with Kayleen Brown. I mean, Toronto, I mean, you know, what? it's probably cold there. I mean, I mean, I guess, I mean, they have, do they have poutine in Toronto? I mean, <laughs> but nah, you know, you know, I can wait. It can wait. We know? don't need to, we don't need to mention anything get else some, that's going on get around some, that time. Get some tacos in Santa Clara. You the know, only be great. thing we should all be focused on is Device Talks Device West. Device Talks West, man. That's where it's at. Absolutely. All right, Chris. All right, man. So we've had a uh, an interesting week for uh, well for uh, for the southeast, but uh, yes. for the metal device industry as well. But totally. uh, in some in some troubling news, it's been uh, it's kind of recurring in, in medtech. So let's hit yes. the new markers, newsmakers, Chris. What's uh, what's number five? 
on this award-winning list. Number five, just, uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, this is a, a great roundup from uh, Associate Editor Sean Hooley of the uh, top 10 surgical robotic stories of the year so far. This is a mass device. So, you know, if you want to catch up and make sure you've, you know, learned of all the top news so far this year's in this, like, really hot space, I mean, check out this article. And uh, just got to also mention, we'll have a lot of uh, great robotic surgery uh, technology uh you know, uh, sessions at uh, at Device Talks West, and we will stop shamelessly plugging our show now. But um, but we have a whole no, host of we yeah. Let's just keep on doing. It, actually, <laughs> we got to keep on going. You're right. Yeah, buckle I mean, up, people. Put on some rain gear because we're going to be <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> no. It, it's a great roundup by by Sean. And at the very bottom, we have the uh, the intro video for Team Surgical Robotics. We've got our MedTech March to Device Talks West. And uh, we do have indeed a lot of uh, a lot of great speakers at uh, yeah. Device X West related to surgical robotics. Uh, we'll have uh, presentations by Virtual Incision, and uh, we'll be talking in this episode. I'll be talking with Nick Damiano of Andromeda Surgical, which has a, a very cool uh, cool new surgical robotics system that they're developing. Uh, but we'll also have ND Addicts. And we'll have uh, uh, someone from NVIDIA talking about how NVIDIA Fantastic. is working in the space. And uh, we'll have Savada Health. So just we'll, we'll post a video on there. Uh, we've got surgical robotics pretty much going on throughout the throughout the uh, the day. And it's also our, our conference, rather, is related or located adjacent to our robo business meeting. So uh, we will have plenty of robotics talk at Device Talks West, no doubt. Fantastic. And we also are rolling out a bunch of other top stories uh, on like roundups on, on massive device this week. I mean, just a lot of top things. I had I had in our uh, roundup of uh, top connected health news. Um, mm-hmm. We've had a round, Sean had a roundup of top uh, neurological tech news. Um, I think today, Friday, we're rolling out uh, our senior editor, Daniel Kirsch, has rolled out a roundup of top women's health news so uh this is the the week to get some uh, top news roundups on mass device and catch yourself up absolutely and going back to surgical robotics we also have uh moon surgical and i'm excited to hear from uh laza medical which is a shifa med company that's uh working in the structural heart space so uh really new cool new applications for surgical robotics yeah absolutely i mean it's like amazing oh. all the different things that uh we're finding out they can they're trying to employ you know surgical robotics with so uh it's uh yeah it's an exciting time it's you know and, and then hopefully we'll you know spread the amount of you know like uh you know surgical know-how that we can have across the country um yeah. Absolutely. All right, Chris Newmarker, what's number four? Number four on this vaunted list. We've got Medtronic launching its Vital Flow ECMO system. That's an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation system. This is to it's basically you know a um, basically like an artificial lung. Um, and uh, it, it, this is an interesting story too because this uh, technology uh, Medtronic acquired it. Um, I, we uh, you know it's kind of snuck in below the radar here. They purchased MC3 cardiopulmonary in March. Um, which they said was like a culmination of like an eight-year par- partnership they'd had with them, but they're bringing that tech in-house, um, you know, you know, as part of their med- Medtronic cardiac surgery uh, business. And now we've got the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the rollout of a vital flow, which is this configurable one system ECMO system. And they, they said they designed this for simplicity and, uh, and performance. Well, that's exciting news from Medtronic. Nice to see them still uh, busy in the acquisition acquisition space, and, uh, and nice to talk about some some good old fashioned traditional med tech like the cardiac surgery portfolio. So uh, great addition yeah. by Medtronic, and I see they also mentioned in the release uh, the work they do with Viant, uh, Viant Medical Contract yeah. Manufacturing site. So you know, Viant, so a good supporter of device sock. So good to good to see Viant mentioned as well. All right, Chris Newmarker, what is number three? Well, number on three Newmarker's on the list, we've got uh, like uh, ResMed launching a new sleep apnea, apnea mask that has like a tube tube up design to it. Um, you know, the AirTouch N30i. Um, so it's like designed uh, the new mask created like kind of like a natural and comfortable sleep experience for uh people with uh, sleep apnea and uh you know and 
and you know, like the, the masks are very important. I mean, I think that I, sure. I, I imagine that's probably one of the challenges and hurdles to get people to use CPAPs. It's like you know, you've got this apparatus attached to your to your face while you're sleeping at night. So you know, any kind of improvements sound great. Um, you know, and they're they're saying this is like a fabric rack frame, and it's soft. They're saying it's soft, it's breathable, moist, moisture wicking uh, design. Um, I think we'd like to actually it'd be really interesting to reach out to, to ResMed and find a little more about how they does this design like reduce the use of magnets because I know that's been kind of a challenge around uh, around CPAP masks is um, you know the, the magnets that you know have hold held previous uh, generations of them together um, hmm. so I mean like how they might interact with implantable devices so I mean that that's something they've been working on as well but I uh, this this definitely looks like um, like a like a more more user friendly design that you kind of like have this uh, plastic thing you know wrapped over the top of your head you know while you're wearing yeah. it. But um, no, it's hard to it's hard to convey in a podcast. But looking at the photo that we have on Mass Device, and again, this is an article uh, written by Sean Hooley. Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's just it's a lot uh, less uh, obtrusive than a traditional mask would be, mm-hmm. which I, which you're right is is the biggest hurdle that I think a lot of folks uh, have with the CPAP devices. No, no news there. So any, yeah. any improvement you can make there for sure. Yeah, you know, um, we had other big... Speed adoption. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And we, we have other big ResMed news this week too. We've had them uh, like launching uh, like a whole like new port... You know, they had new uh, patri- patient-centric products, you know, to kind of like these like digital health ads to, you know, what they're offering. Um you know, with, uh, for, for sleep apnea, you know, including like, a, a you know, they've got their, uh, you know, their, uh, you know, they, they, you know, discuss their, uh, my air, uh, you know, consumer app, um, you know, so, but I've, I've always, I mean, over the years, I've noticed ResMed has been, they've definitely been like kind of on one of the companies really on the forefront of, uh, of like, kind of like these digital health offerings, Absolutely. you know, so, I mean, this looks like them just like, you know, pushing this even, uh, even further, uh, you know, forward. And it looks like it even like they're even using a sleep staging data from Apple health and health connect, you know, to work with my air. So, so that you can get your, uh, get your Apple watch in on the action, you know, with this. Uh, no, and if, if anyone wants insights on that, uh, the interview I did with Jim Hollingshead, who's now CEO of Insulate, uh, he built the whole digital strategy, connected care strategy at ResMed. That's fantastic. And uh, really, really, I, to your, to your point, Christy, I always knew they, they I knew that they were, seen as leaders uh in this space i don't completely understand why until i did that interview um so if folks wow. want some more insights on connected health can, can listen to that and, and of course he's at insulate now helping them uh, devise their connected strategy for for omnipod so fantastic yeah both i mean you know both both that cpap space as you know with with resmed as well as that uh you know the um you know the uh, you know that that diabetes space. My gosh, with insulin pups and CGMs. I mean, both of those I think really have stood out as areas where they're just packaging like all kinds of like these interactive digital health features to help people track their health. And you know, both sleep apnea and diabetes. I mean, those are both you know conditions where people really really want to be you know following their data. All right, fantastic. Let us roll on to, I think we're on number two. Right? Number Here's two somewhere. on the list. Um, number two, we unfortunately have, uh, you know, we're looks like we're heading potentially into another, you know, some kind of layoff season with, uh, with MedTech. Um, we had, you know, two, uh, you know, two stories on, on mass device this week about layoffs, you know, the big one being Johnson Johnson laying off more than 200 employees, you know, uh, in, in New Brunswick, which is where their headquarters is. Um, you know, we also have like, you know, Stryker um, laying off more workers at a uh, at a plant in Florida that they, uh, you know, plan to uh, to close um, by the end of uh, 2026. And that'll, uh, you know, by by the time that's closed in 26, they'll will have laid off roughly 500 workers there. So, um, you know, just some unfortunate news. Um, you know, it's like definitely, I mean, the Fed's starting to cut rates because, you know, like. You know they've they've been noticing a softening in the uh, job market. Though I will have to say, as we're talking here on Friday, you know the new uh, job de- the new job data shows that the U.S. added two hundred fifty four thousand uh, jobs in the past month, which uh, surpassed mm-hmm. expectations. So I mean, it's still you know we fingers crossed. Maybe maybe we'll get 
still get that soft landing that you know the the Fed's been talking about that seemed really hard to get. But we'll we'll just have to keep on watching this. And there seem to be a lot of other companies that are hiring as well. Yeah, in tech, so totally. it's more of a realignment than anything else. And uh, you get near the end of the year, you always see companies starting to do some adjustments and whatnot. It's not it's not great, uh, especially if you're sort of it just gives gives credence or or, or uh, really demonstrates the wisdom in, in just managing your career and ensuring that you're you're always sort of looking and, and planning and and, uh, and and thinking about what's next for yourself because totally. because yeah. uh, these things can come out of nowhere sometimes and they can be really uh, really traumatic for for folks. So totally. I do feel for for everyone who's lost their jobs. Uh, but I, I'm confident that there are other jobs out there for them. So, especially I, in the med tech industry. You know, I noticed that uh, Joe Mullings of the Mullings Group had a, a post on LinkedIn this week where he was, you know, he, uh, Joe Stradamus was, uh, was saying yeah. that he, you know, he, uh, he, he was saying there was going to be a round of layoffs in med tech. Uh, but I mean, he was kind of giving like that kind of advice, you know, like, hey, you yep. know, like you got to, got to kind of be entrepreneurial with your uh with your career and like figure out how you're you're building stuff and it can be you know an opportunity to try new things but yes you can't it's uh it's not like the old days when you know my uh you know my my, my grandpa back in ohio like worked at a pet food factory his whole life that just doesn't work that way anymore no it does not no, no. it does not so uh good luck to all those folks who have been impacted i'm sure you'll you'll find something and uh, I don't know, reach out, reach out to us on uh, on LinkedIn, Chris and I, and just let us know how you're totally. doing. Um, yes. If we can help, we will. Absolutely. All right, All right Chris Newmarker. Troubling uh, number one as well. Why don't you roll? Yeah. I mean, um, you know, just just really uh, just just horrible news out of the, the you know the southeast with uh yeah, with the effects of hurricane helene and uh this uh this also had an effect on med tech. I mean specifically that uh you know the um you know, Baxter, their largest battery, um, is w- was you know in uh, in in North Carolina, their North Cove site in uh, Marion, North Carolina. You know, in the mountains, and uh, it's it's shut down now. I mean, bridges bridges washed out in the area, like wow. all, all kinds of problems. And uh, you know, we've you know we've got I've got a story that I wrote earlier this week about that on medical design outsourcing. I'm gonna be updating, you know, today as Baxter had a news release saying like they didn't still have an ETA of when they'll be able to get that plant online. Um, it sounded like they had uh, like put in a temporary bridge to try to get out. I mean these are like IV bags and supplies like this and this is like one right. of the main producers of that for the United States. So I mean there's already media reports around the country right now of health providers starting to figure out ways to try to like control the use of those, you know, so we don't have a, a shortage because, you know, people uh, people need those to say to you know stay alive. Um, you know, I uh, you know, so Yeah, we have something in the globe today about that uh, about um patients getting Gatorade instead of IVs if they're obviously just need some, some uh, replenishment, yeah. uh, but mother certain st- changes to SOPs that they're, they're doing to save on bags. So, uh, hopefully it'll, uh, it'll sort itself out before, uh, before the supply crunch is really hit because, uh, obviously the, you can't think of any more critical piece of equipment than a, an IV bag, uh, for the health and care of patients. Yeah. I mean, Baxter is, uh, saying too, that, uh, they, uh, they're working with FDA to try to draw more on their international network, but, you know, so hopefully things, things move quickly on that as, as well, but it sounds like the FDA needs to figure out what to do with that as, as well. Like, I mean, so maybe there are some international resources back to Baxter drawn, but it sounds like they need to get a Get, get an FDA green light that they're cool with those products coming into the U.S. Our medical design outsourcing uh, managing editor Jim Hamran just just uh, like a few years ago had a uh, an article like as the pandemic was ending, pointing out like yes you know all the supply chain problems with the pandemic um, were, were starting to wrap up, but you know climate change was going to present an ongoing crisis for the industry and my gosh this uh you know this this uh you know what's happening at baxter is uh, just just a great example of that i mean who, who knew like you know you're in the middle of the mountains you can like a hurricane that dumps a ton of rain can just cause a horrific amount of uh, amount of damage so we're uh, nobody's nobody's immune to, to climate change i used to have the wishful thinking that i was you know 
safer up in Minnesota because I'm like, wow, we got really cold winters. And it's like, like, why, why is all there this wildfire smoke from Canada in the air? You know, you just back to the uh, mosquito borne illnesses. Let's circle back to the beginning of our conversation. Yes, so. we'll have to like the times they are got a party sure. like it's 1899. <laughs> <laughs> And if anyone who's listening uh, saw the image I posted on uh, on LinkedIn, Chris Newmarker disappeared because he had to go talk to yes. a sprinkler guy. Yes, so. <laughs> it is the season. Like, it is the season. Win- winter is coming, uh, Tom. Uh, winter is coming. <laughs> Chris Newmarker, we have one more episode until yeah. uh, Device Talks West, and then we'll we'll see each other in uh, in Santa Clara. So have a you have too, a great man. Friday, buddy. You too, buddy. Great, it'll be great to see you in two weeks. Take care, everybody. Hello, Device Talkers. It's Kayleen Brown, Managing Editor of Device Talks. We are so thrilled to bring you our Women in MedTech Luncheon happening at Device Talks West, October 17th. So from 12.15 to 1.15 p.m., we are bringing together women in the medical device industry and our allies for a one-hour networking session. So please, please, please join us on October 17th at Device Talks West for the Women in MedTech Luncheon. And a huge thank you to our generous, generous sponsors, Aptics, Capstan Medical, Global Logic, Integer Holdings, and Westfall Technic. We couldn't host our networking session if it weren't for your huge support. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for supporting female leadership in the medical device industry. For more information, and of course, to register, please go to west.devicetalks.com. I'll see you October 17th. Well, Brody Galloway, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Tom. So excited to be here. It's uh, it's, it's good to talk to a young person interested in medtech, uh, and uh, I'm eager to, to have folks hear your story. What was, what, was, uh, what was the first thing that kind of drew you into the medtech industry, Brody? Well, I've been around it my whole life as a patient with uh, CHD. I was born with a congenital heart defect called truncus arteriosus. Mm -hmm. I've had 10 uh, surgeries my whole life, three open heart, seven cath procedures, Uh, been followed by a cardiologist my whole life. So I've been always on my foot in the med tech industry and uh, the medical field. So having those experiences as a patient, we'll get into into what you've turned that sort of inspiration into a really great effort. But I could see I could see two different directions: someone being completely turned off by medical devices and by healthcare, and just wanting to go away in the other direction, or perhaps doing what you're doing, which is kind of leaning into it. What was it about the med tech industry that uh, drew you in? Other than the fact it's it's been, uh, well, I guess a a life saving. Uh, a life-saving effort for you in, in, uh, in, in all the procedures you've gone through? Yeah, well, I've really always been into engineering and problem okay. solving. The, the medicine side hasn't interested me as much. When I had my echo procedures where they used the scope to look at my heart from the outside, I, I was always like asking questions and how, how are they seeing my heart from out here? Things like that. Mm-hmm. And that kind of sparked my interest on the engineering side and problem solving and innovation. So through middle school, I went at a pre-engineering program and started my engineering, engineering career. So not necessarily medicine. Um, I was, I was surrounded by it. I wasn't quite uh, leaning into it at an earlier age. I, but that's a good question, you know, like many people might be more scared of doctors right. because of their experience. And I really was never affected in that way. I, I was at a children's hospital, so all the nurses were always super nice to me. So it wasn't the worst time being there. That's that's a really nice outlook to have. So what have you uh, turned your experience into? Talk a bit about uh, what your what you've built and, uh, and partly why, why you're here today. You've got, uh, some requests of the, of the med tech industry. Yeah. So I was really interested in the medical device field. I, I started writing about devices I found interesting, um, around my freshman year of high school. And as I wrote more and more, I'm like, okay, I shared this on LinkedIn, right? So I started posting on LinkedIn, 
Um, but I wanted a more community-based um, uh, area where I could share my findings and share the medical uh, device industry to my classmates and student body. So that's where I started uh, Envision MedTech, and that, mm-hmm. that was the club. That was to show the opportunities of what MedTech could offer to students and the future, both, both in clinical areas, engineering, regulatory, all those different aspects. My sophomore year, I had my seventh, or yes, my seventh cath procedure. Um, I needed a stent placed in. Oh, really? And yeah, so I got in contact with a former nurse um, and a nurse at the time because um, she was working the ICU and she was sharing how many of the patients were flown in from neighboring countries because they didn't have access uh, to both the necessary pediatric medical technology, but also the uh, skilled clinicians. And given my high interest in med tech at the time, my writing in the club, I was like, okay, that's a problem. And I didn't quite know where to go with it quite yet. And then, um, yeah. but she got me in contact with the founder of Helping Hands for Honduras. And he shared what he needed. Um, we got on a call and I, I said, yeah, I can do that. Before I knew how or what I would need to do, I I said, uh, yeah, we can do that. And he sent me what he needed and we got to work. So was it a, a list of equipment? Is that what he sent over? Yeah, he sent uh, a list of about 75 different uh, devices slash uh, tools that would be needed uh, to treat patients in Honduras. So what what on earth possessed you to say, yeah, I can do that? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I could find 75 pieces of medical equipment, and I've been covering the industry for 25 years. Well, it wasn't as binding as it might seem. Um, they were already, they already had a source of devices, so it was more of a, let me learn how to do this, and let me see what I can do. Um, I didn't, of course, I didn't want to come out with nothing. So uh, we worked hard and I got in contact with more of my former nurses and we collected a thousand devices that ended up helping save 13 lives in Honduras in August. Wow. That's amazing. So what kind of devices, uh, a few examples, what, what kind of devices are we talking about? So this one was an open heart mission. However, okay. we did collect a lot of uh, cardiac catheters um, we did Foley catheters, uh, a lot of surgical and um, ICU supplies that was needed um, in the OR. Uh, we didn't, we don't have, we didn't get uh, diagnostic devices or like the the higher um, level equipment. We we're mm-hmm. working, we were mainly working on um, like the stuff that is FDA expired in the U.S. because um, in the U.S. they cap out a lot of the equipment. Um, but it can be used in other areas like Honduras. Interesting. So you're in the midst of, of collecting devices now for, for another, uh, another mission trip, right? Uh, tell folks what you're, what you're looking for. So right now we're collecting um, things that would be used for a catheter mission trip in January, um, like cardiac cath- uh, catheters, um, any uh, IVs, things like that. Um, are great. Any any ICU equipment for pediatrics is um, wonderful. So yeah, that's a lot of the stuff that we're looking for right now. And so you're hoping to, to do you get this generally from uh, device manufacturers or from hospitals who have them lying around? What's your what your primary what is your primary source of uh, donated equipment? Right now, our main source is um, through hospitals. I we collected our equipment through Nicholas Children's Hospital, and we collected from uh, Palms West. Uh, those two hospitals contributed, and I still have some devices behind me that will be used for January. Um, but yeah, just so far we've been focused on hospitals. But as we progress and we have more capital and we make more connections, we want to establish more partnerships with uh, manufacturers and companies that be willing to provide equipment and uh, funding for these trips. 
That's fantastic. I'll post the uh, I'll post the the information you're looking for on LinkedIn. Folks can find that on my LinkedIn, and they can also find you, Brody Galloway, on LinkedIn as well. They should connect with you there. Uh, final question: What is your uh, What are your plans for the future? You're in an exciting time in your life. Yeah. So for Envision MedTech, we want to continue um, the helping out Helping Hands for Honduras. Um, they're a great uh, organization. We trust them. They fly out their um, clinicians from the Cardiac Institute at Mex in Mexico. So that their uh, staff is a highly skilled. That's a world-class institute. So we can trust them with the equipment we send. And then um, we want to continue helping them. We also, once we get more funding, buy those um, better tools to continue providing them. And then once we establish a, a good pipeline of devices, we can expand our reach. And then also... I, I'm going on these trips not only for these uh, devices, but also uh, to share my story. So when a patient sees their, or sorry, when a, a family member or a parent sees their baby in such a, um, a, a poor position or a um, vulnerable position, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult for the parents. And for me to be able to share my personal story and how far I've come. And I was once in that child's position. It's, it's instills a lot of hope and empowers them uh, to get through the hardships of having a patient with CHD. And we want to continue uh, sharing my story and instilling hope in that way. And then also providing the devices. And then yes. as I am a student as well. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I have college next year. Um, yeah, what are your plans? Give, give, you have some, some career aspirations at this point? Um, I want to major in biomedical engineering. Um, that's going to set me up well um, for what I want to do in the industry. Definitely go into the med tech industry. Um, I don't have, I don't, I'm not heart set on a particular college. I'm looking at many, um, but yeah, those are, those are my plans. Well, it's exciting stuff. You've already got a, 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 uh, a great accomplishment under your belt. And it's in, as a dad, I can certainly say that, that seeing you thrive and, and, and contribute would certainly give me hope if I were in that unfortunate position that you described. So it's, it's great that you're doing that. It's great that you're actually helping people and, uh, look forward to talking to you, uh, in a decade or so when you're doing something fantastic in the med tech industry. Thank you, Tom. This is Tom Selmy of Device Talks. We're excited to bring you another great program for Device Talks West here at the Santa Clara Convention Center, talking new business models, new missions, new intentions. I can't wait until we fill this auditorium with MedTech's best engineers, entrepreneurs, and executives. This is Device Talks West. The foundation of connected care is the who we are that drives the what we do. We shape our environment and then our environment shapes us thoughtful discussions of how it impacts not only markets, but society and the workforce. What is it doing for the patient? And that's what our technology needs to be. I look at what the standard of care is today. Are there areas where we can improve upon the standard of care or are there areas where there are significant gaps? And that's what drives me. What am I trying to accomplish? You know, getting back to that core, what problem am I trying to solve? Am I going to do something new and really move the needle for patient outcomes? So there's a ton of work to be done, and that's what keeps me excited. Why did you choose MedTech? Find out at Device Talks West on October 16th and 17th. Register at west.devicetalks.com. The folks that are saving lives, they're all here. Nick Damiano, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Great to be here, Tom. Excited to have you at uh, Device Talks West. Uh, you'll be presenting in our engineering theater, uh, telling a bit of uh, Andromeda Surgical's story. Uh, we've had you on the podcast before when you were CEO of Zenflow. I think we've covered your background a little bit about your approach into medtech, but maybe we could just bring folks a little bit up to speed. What was... Uh, what, what drew you to the med tech sector and uh, how did you find your way to, uh, to lead startups? Yeah, so I was going to be a surgeon initially. My, my dad was a surgeon and uh, 
you know, I was, I felt like it was something I would be interested in. And mm-hmm. uh, so went to, went to college and, and, you know, started as pre-med then, uh, and this is at, at Stanford and I got kind of sucked into the, the startup scene while I was there <laughs> and, and eventually came to the realization that I'd prefer to go into, into tech and, but wanted to stay close to, to patient care and healthcare. And so decided to become an engineer and then work for med tech startups. And uh, then after kind of going through the ups and downs of a startup as an engineer for a few years, uh, decided to take matters in my own hands and become a founder. And now I've, I've been a founder now with, with three startups over the last, uh, I think, more than 12 years at this mm-hmm. point. Do you think you would have been uh, enjoyed being a surgeon? I think I would have. I really like using the the surgery simulator we have at the office here, <laughs> and uh, you know it would have been it would have been fun in, in certain ways. But I have no doubt that this was the right path. And uh, I mean, just all the, I think both the the training that goes into it and the rigidity and the the hierarchy in medicine uh, is a little bit little bit tough for for my personality i i prefer to be a founder and uh you know kind of shape shape my own destiny and and build things yeah they feel like they do feel like different worlds or, or different ways of spending your time uh, both doing good but in very different ways uh and you're you did the stanford biodesign program as well right i did yeah, yeah that was yeah. was really good i mean yeah. really got me started and, and networked well in medtech mm-hmm no, oh, that's great, great, great start. So let's uh, let's get into uh, into the company and Andromeda. Um, it, first, before we get into the juicy stuff about the tech, how did you uh, come to settle on wanting to uh, start the company and, and and lead a surgical robotics company? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of it didn't really follow the the biodesign pathway where you start with a need mm. at the beginning. Uh, it was more of a meta need where we, I mean, having been in med tech for a while, I, I realized that. Uh, a lot of times when you're in the operating room, things don't go according to plan and there are challenges that, that come up where the the outcomes often aren't as good as you, you'd hope they would be. So there was this meta need of making surgery just safer, easier, more error proof. And so I met with my uh, co-founder through the Y Combinator network. We had both been former uh, founders from Y Combinator. Uh, I was there with, with Zenflow and he was there with a company called Starsky Robotics, hmm. which was a uh, autonomous truck company. And he had actually built the first autonomous truck that ever drove on a highway without a person behind the wheel. Uh, so wow. had a really interesting background and had we had both been thinking about the the need to make surgery better. And I think he also was kind of thinking that oh, we, we built this technology for this autonomous driving technology for vehicles. Why couldn't we do it for, for other spaces? And one that he was looking at independently before we even met was was surgery. So we'd both been thinking about this from different angles, me from med tech, him from autonomous vehicles. And we just got to brainstorming about what we were, whether we could actually build this and what it would take to do that. And then also realizing that we couldn't just go and build a general purpose autonomous surgical robot. We needed to figure out where to start. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the first step we decided to, to undertake was just talking to surgeons and looking for needs. So then kind of backing into the biodesign process. Mm -hmm. And I knew a lot of urologists having built a company before this in urology. And so we, we talked to maybe 15, 20 surgeons over a few weeks and uh, most of them were urologists. And then we ended up finding a really compelling need in urology that we thought uh, was really uh, promising from a, a need standpoint. And just the market dynamics made a lot of sense. So we decided to go down that path and we've stayed on the path ever since we've, you know, kind of also figured out that there's a lot of needs in, in endourology that we could address. Mm-hmm. So there's also some, some promising kind of second and third indications we could go for. Interesting. So I'm sure people listening hear, hear the words autonomous surgical and robot and their curiosity has got to be uh, peaked. And I put them in directly in that order. So let's get into, that's the how you got together. Let's get into the, what, you, what you're working on. Tell us what uh, Andromeda Surgical is up to. Yeah. So as I said, at a uh, high level, it's autonomous surgical robots. Yep. So we believe that, I mean, whereas robotics have been taking over surgery over the last couple of decades, especially in, in recent years, that the next step is going to be AI and autonomy for um, kind of 
augmenting these robots and making not just making surgery physically easier, but also mentally, cognitively easier. Mm. Uh, so we feel like there's a lot more outcome improvement that can happen from adding AI and autonomy in kind of the same way it's been added to to vehicles, to uh, to surgical robots. And so yeah, we we're we're generally building that. We're building it in steps where we're not going to just release a fully autonomous. Uh, if you know the self-driving terminology, level five self-driving robot right away, we're going to build a robot first that's got some kind of driver assist features. Mm -hmm. uh, like if you know, and we use a lot of vehicle analogies where uh, you go from driving to driving with a GPS, and then we will layer on as we go and you know gain experience, collect data, we'll layer on more and more autonomy features. And uh, the first indication, as I mentioned, is in urology. We're starting with a procedure called homium laser renucleation of the prostate or HOLEP. Uh, it's a, a BPH procedure. It's got really the best outcomes, both in terms of safety and effectiveness as far as surgical treatments go. And it's really the only procedure that's a true cure for BPH besides taking the whole prostate out. Mm. Um, there's been, we found lots of surgeon enthusiasm beyond HOLEP, behind HOLEP in the last uh, especially the last 10 years where it's it's really growing at a, a tremendous rate even without us or anybody really marketing this. So good sign that surgeons are adopting this rapidly um, despite the fact that there's really not much industry push behind it. Describe if you would for me the the, the surgical robotic system. Were we talking about a, a larger system that, that has the arms and that is moving autonomous, autonomously or are you approaching this at a, at a, at a, with a different design in mind? Yeah, I mean, the hardware is very simple. One one thing we've set up to do as a company is focus as much as possible on the software, which is is kind of unusual for surgical robots, mm -hmm. where the hardware is usually of, and in med tech in general, is the hardware is a big focus. Yep. People are more hardware oriented than software. So we've taken some off the shelf parts. We have an, an off the shelf arm, and then we've found a kind of general purpose cart that we mounted on. And then what we do is make this custom adapter that just holds the surgical tools that are already out there. So we're not playing the disposables game mm -hmm. like most robotics play. We're just using tools that that already exist, which has made the hardware really simple. And um, one, one big benefit of working with things that are already being used in the surgical treatment is that we can partner with, you know, the scope companies, the laser companies, it's a, it's a laser procedure uh, to really help us much more easily access the market since they're already out there selling to the same same customers mm -hmm. uh, so yeah it's it's off the it's mostly off the shelf pretty simple and then uh the big differentiator the big values being added with the software and what is the need what where where do we need uh or where in neurology is is a uh, an autonomous procedure going to be helpful yeah so for this first whole app indication we've seen that this procedure is tremendously safe and effective. Mm -hmm. The results really speak for themselves. But then the the challenge is the learning curve. So the reason why this is only 10% of procedures and not 80% is because it's it's just an incredible amount of effort required to, to train and it's really stressful. So just learning how to do this procedure, how to do an enucleation of the prostate instead of a, a typical resection is, uh, is kind of counterintuitive and hard to learn for urologists. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through this been reported about 50 cases to learn this procedure, even at a, a basic level. And then we found that the first few hundred cases can be really stressful and difficult for urologists. So that's what's keeping people from adopting this procedure is, is the learning curve. Mm. And so we feel we felt like we could really reduce that. A lot of the things that are hard about the procedure, the kind of spatial orientation and the, the plane recognition where you're trying to identify certain anatomical features uh, could be done a lot more easily with a with a robot and with with AI guidance. Uh, so we've been able to show already in the first less than year and a half of the company that we're able to add a lot of value as far as uh, helping the surgeons with those hard parts of the procedure. Hmm. So what what is the the stressful part and the challenging part? Is it the the fact that you're just the the, the limited area in which you're working in, and and the the the, the small amount of tissue that you want to strike with the laser uh, and, and you don't want to stray too far from that. What is, what is, what creates the stress for the surgeons? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're striking this balance between going too far out where you cut through the capsule of the prostate, mm -hmm. which is, 
is, uh, you know, not a, not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, kind of the main thing you're avoiding when you're doing the enucleation. And also, if, you, if you're too conservative and you go too far in, then you're not going to remove all, all the tissue and it can regrow and cause problems later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to you want to strike that balance and really follow this plane. The procedure is often likened to coring out an orange from the, the inside where you're removing the pulp from the peel hmm. and the pulp's the enlarged tissue called the adenoma. Uh, it's more it's more in a lot of ways, more like an onion where there's different possible false layers where you, you want to enucleate a certain plane, but not the, the wrong plane. Mm -hmm. And when surgeons are new to the procedure, they, they get lost and they often go along a, the wrong path. Then they have to kind of go back and find where they were. And once you create all these erroneous cuts, then you end up making a mess of it. And it's, it's harder and harder to go back and, and reestablish yourself in the right plane. Mm -hmm. uh, so it becomes worse and worse as you make more and more mistakes. Uh, so even with our, our first generation, which we've already built, we, we have this GPS-like navigational guidance where they can see where they are compared to all the landmarks, all the anatomical features, and really remain oriented in the right plane and keep progressing uh, in the right direction towards the, the eventual goal, which is the bladder neck where you end up at the end. Mm. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of value even in that. And then as we go, we'll build more and more features to make it even easier. So where do the insights that, where do you draw the insights to inform your software to understand where what needs to be part of the procedure, what tissue does need to be part of the procedure? Are you working with skilled surgeons in this who are sort of teaching your system or, or are you basing, is your system basing itself strictly in love GPS sort of element as it's able to read the area better than maybe a human eye can and can help really, again, direct the procedure more effectively? Yeah. So we've, we've been working with a lot of the leading surgeons in this procedure since the beginning. Mm -hmm. I've known the, the surgeon who invented the procedure down in New Zealand named Peter Gilling has been uh, very, very actively involved and enthusiastic. And I, I knew him before this company from my prior company. Uh, so he, He's kind of the top global thought leader. He's actually going to do the first cases when we do our, our first human studies soon. And then just a lot of other surgeons around the world have been actively involved in development. They've also been providing video data for our um, AI training. So one one key thing you have to do to, to build the AI is to collect data from uh, procedures that are being done manually out there. So we're not creating new procedures. Mm -hmm. We're just creating procedures that are already really great in terms of outcomes and, and making them better and easier. So we've been out there partnering with lots of urologists around the world and collecting video data that's going to be used to train our, our algorithms. Okay. So uh, uh, autonomous uh, surgical robotics has been tried in the past by other companies, or at least initially pursued and then abandoned in, in, in because there was seemingly a, a, a reluctance for for an adoption of autonomous surgical robotics that people were, weren't quite ready for that yet. What helps you, what, what makes you believe you can sort of cross that bridge when others haven't and granted those were founded a few years ago and this technology does move quickly, but what, what makes you feel that you have a better chance at, uh, at success? Yeah, the timing's really good. Now uh, there's a lot more acceptance of AI in our everyday lives mm -hmm. and autonomy, um, you know, both from the, the chat GPTs of the world, which people are, are using pretty regularly now. It's kind of made it mainstream. And then more on the, the line of AI that, I mean, this is not a large language model. It's not the same thing as ChatGPT. It's it's more like your traditional machine learning that's being used in technology like autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've also seen that if you're in the Bay Area, at least, or a few other cities, you see the, the Waymo cars <laughs> all over the place that are driving autonomously with no human behind the wheel. You've got if people that own Teslas, Teslas have full self-driving now where it's able to get from almost, you know, flawlessly from point A to point B by itself. So that's that's definitely a trend that's happening in the background. We've also been able to build a team from that space. A lot of our people are from autonomous vehicles. Uh, so they've really built this in another another vertical already. Mm -hmm. And then on the, the surgeon side, so I think that background trend does help. We found that that first of all, urologists are just generally tech savvy and want to adopt new things, mm -hmm. including robots. Uh, da Vinci, of course, got started Good in point. the urology space early on. And then I think you have to also 
build it in the right way that, so this, this uh, stepwise approach really helps where what we're launching at first is not such a crazy huge step from where they are now. It's kind of similar to, to robots that are out there uh, in the existing market. And then as we go and we add more autonomy, we're going to take it step by step. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to be a huge leap from one generation to the next. And then also one thing that's, that's really key is the human is going to be in the loop. It's not going to be, for the foreseeable future, it's not going to be you press a button and walk away and the whole <laughs> surgery gets gets done. You're going to have the urologist there actively involved. It's more like autopilot in a plane where you uh, the surgeon's going to be at the console. They can always take over mm-hmm. or adjust as it's going. It's not just going to, uh, the AI is not just going to go rogue and run by itself. No, that's a great point. Uh, and, and great point about Da Vinci. Is this, is, is this a procedure that Da Vinci is, is used for? Are you, are you going up against Da Vinci or is this something that Da Vinci isn't, uh, isn't appropriate for? It's not being used for this. There's a kind of a similar procedure that's more invasive called robotic simple prostatectomy, okay. which is something you can do with Da Vinci. If you can enucleate endoscopically with Holep, you would almost certainly do that because it's just less invasive and has fewer complications. Uh, it's not not really in any real way a competitor of Da Vinci at this point. We're we're all endoscopically focused for even for this first indication, even the the ones after that. Uh, so yeah, it's we're not going head to head with them, which is is good because <laughs> as if you've seen the the companies that have tried to go head to head with Da Vinci, it's it's been a, a really tough go. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and what impact would would a successful uh, product have on the on the market? Do you see that now there's I think I think you said the percentage earlier. What percentage of urologists are capable of doing this procedure? Uh, do you see that increasing by three x or four x? Because now more of the surgeons who maybe weren't able to do it before now have the tools that, and the and the assistance they need to do it effectively. Yeah, I mean, there's there's clearly a lot of demand for Holep. It's it's something that mm-hmm. urologists have been very eager to adopt. When you look at the training courses there full and booked up months or even a year ahead of time in a lot of cases. Uh, so there is this huge groundswell of interest. We we do see this becoming the dominant procedure for surgical BPH treatment. Uh, I think you, a lot of urologists would agree with that. If if Holep were easier, that that would be the, the gold standard option uh, just because of the outcomes are so much better. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we think there's a lot of room to grow from the current roughly 10% of procedures that, that are whole up. Uh, and we certainly see it being the the majority of procedures once we get this deployed. And just final questions about the company itself. Uh, how have you been, do, how have you done with financing? Where are you with uh, rounds raised? And uh, what are your needs in the future? Do you have a sense of that yet? Yeah, so we we founded the company in April of last year. Mm-hmm. So it's it's oh, wow. been... Less than a year and a half okay. so far. We, we raised a, a pre-seed and seed round last year. I think we've totaled up to a little under $7 million in total funding. So we've tried to be relatively lean. Robotics are always expensive, and it takes a lot of people to build the, uh, the you know both the robotics and the AI stuff that we're building. Uh, we are going to be opening a Series A fairly soon, mm-hmm. so that, that'll be, be happening this year. And um, that's also lining up with our, our first in human studies. So we're going to be in the clinic uh, pretty soon. And so uh, we can look forward to an announcement of that after it happens. Interesting. And final question, uh, the, the, your ability to use any surgical, not your, your not your decision not to build a surgical tool business, but rather a sort of assistive surgical robotic business. What opportunities does that open up for you in terms of partnership? Uh, How do you, how do you think this would be sold differently than, uh, perhaps other surgical robotics we've seen another company, Rob Surgical, that has sort of a same open approach to it. I guess this seems would feel more like you're selling a medical device than a surgical robotic system. You're you're like sort of selling another way to to assist in a procedure, but you're not connecting a, a surgeon or or a healthcare facility with all of your instruments and 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 all of your tools. It's a really long and convoluted question, but how is this a different business than perhaps a surgical robotic system, a surgical robotics yeah. company that has created its own tools, its own whatever's that need to be used as part of that system. I mean, when you think about it from a first principle standpoint, we didn't see a need to create new tools yeah. for the procedure. The ones that are being used work great. And as I said, it's it's, uh, it's a little bit easier to access the market when you can partner with them instead of competing with them, uh, people that make those tools to 
to get get to the market. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we've seen a lot of support from companies that are they're in that space. And what we see in the long run in terms of surgical robots, which is what's happened in a lot of spaces, is that the hardware becomes more commoditized and more of the exciting stuff happens with software. So we've set up to be a lot more of a software focused company where we're trying to keep the hardware as minimal as possible. And our business model will likely, though we're still finalizing this, align with more of a software type model mm. where when you when we, for example, add a, a new procedure to the, the platform, it's not going to be much of a hardware change. We're going to have a software module that kind of is trained on that that other procedure. And so it's it's mostly going to be software upgrade based as we improve the, the platform. We, we'll probably have new little adapters for different for to hold different tools, but that's really going to be it. Um, yeah, I mean, we we see robotics going this way. I know that that's that's contrarian. The, this disposables model is believed to be the way that robotics should should work. Um, though, yeah, I mean, I think as a as a software company, anyone who's built hardware in in the med tech world knows that it it's a slow and painful process. Mm -hmm. So um, even if you know people can can make the case that we are leaving money on the table by not making disposables, <laughs> we can make software which is is higher margin and then also move much faster because we're focused on the software and don't have to go through all the additional development and testing that comes with building additional hardware. As you increase complexity, it just gets harder almost exponentially um, the more and more stuff you actually have to build and ship. But at the end of the day, are you selling both the software and the system or are you selling just the software do you see? I mean, do you, do you sell... What, what? Yeah, there will there'll be a base platform. It's it's kind of like, I mean, we a lot of car analogies. We liken it to, to te <laughs> Tesla where you, you buy the car and there's software upgrades. Gotcha. It's even more focused on the software side though than than that, where they'll, they'll buy the robot at, at the beginning and then they're mostly going to interact with it like a, a software platform from there on out where, yeah, it's it's not going to be a whole lot of excess hardware as we keep growing and expanding. It's just going to be uh, a lot of software upgrades. Interesting. So if, if, you, if you buy this in the, the Gen 1, you can expect to get a lot of um, interesting stuff coming down the pipe later on. Okay. Well, sounds great. Well, we look forward to hearing the story at uh, Device Talks West, Nick. Thanks for taking some time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here again. All right, well, that is a wrap. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. Great to have you here. I hope to see you at Device Talks West. Again, it's happening October 16th and 17th at the Santa Clara Convention Center. Use the code DTPOD25 to save 25%. Uh, for podcast purposes, make sure you subscribe to the Device Talks Podcast Network. Leave a comment uh, or a rating on your podcast player and uh, give us some stars. It really helps people find the podcast and they're kind of fun to read. So. Uh, maybe I'll start reading some on uh, on air, like uh, like they do in some of the podcasts that I listen to. So again, please subscribe to the Device Talks Podcast Network. And do me a favor, share this episode on your social media channels. And uh, make sure you connect with me on LinkedIn. Make sure you connect with Kayleen Brown on LinkedIn. Make sure you connect with Chris Newmarker on LinkedIn. And of course, follow Device Talks, Mass Device and Medical Design and Outsourcing on LinkedIn. We put out lots of great content, thoughts, and uh, perspectives, and I know you'll uh, you'll have a richer LinkedIn experience if you do it. So that's a wrap, folks. Thanks again for joining us on this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast.